Thank you for having me. <laughs> One thing I hate to do is I hate to talk about my work. I don't know. I felt like I made my work so I didn't have to talk about my work. That's one thing. Um, let me get past these. All right, all right. I'll start here. Well, just to tell you a little bit about me, um, you mentioned a lot about me um, in terms of my background. I went to, I went to school at um, Atlanta College of Art and I studied um, sculpture. Um, no, actually I went to art school with the intention. I had this teacher in high school and he wanted me. He said, no, there's no reason for you to go and study sculpture and paint. He said, go into design. I went into, you know, the first class. I think I said, no, I went to a lecture and it was this Cuban artist named Luis Cruz Azaceta. And he was, he was talking about his days in New York and he, was, and he just looked like he was having so much fun in the 80s and he was talking about his work and he was doing his thing and I changed my major immediately. Um, these are photographs, um, these are photographs that were given to me and I usually use these first because it was one of the first influences with, with my work was that my grandmother gave me about 400 photographs before she died and she hadn't been to my studio, she lived in Virginia and I just remember um, her giving me the photographs and from then on when she gave me those images I my goal was to make work that communicated with those that were the closest to me and so with these photographs for a long time I used these photographs um, close to 400 but a lot of them were like unknown family members so I choose to use the ones that I knew I didn't know anything about because I felt like those photographs would become discarded and I use those photographs uh, almost like the same attitude as that when you come and you approach African art for the first time in a museum and you don't know the history about it, but you feel the soul of it, you feel the energy from it. So I was really reading the energy from the photographs. Um, and I'm jumping around. And some of these photographs, I have a lot of photographs that are in here. I want to run through them real quick and I'll speak about them as fast as I can and keep going and keep going and keep going. Um, so this was like a recent painting that I did and it was commissioned by Atlanta Falcons. I'm sorry they're not winning, but yeah, the Atlanta Falcons. Um, and it was commissioned for their new stadium. And uh, the stadium um, was located real close to Atlanta University. Atlanta University was all the HBCUs, uh, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, Morris Brown, all the schools um, existed. Um, and so what I did was I, I created a painting. When you, if you were to look outside the window of the stadium on the left side, you would actually see the, um, the campus of Atlanta University. So I wanted to do a piece that was based around that. I wanted to deal with the subject of football, but, but it was more than just a game. Um, so in dealing with the subject, I, um, I used images from HBCUs from 1920 to like 1908, 1911. And um, some of them are just different. This is me working in the studio with it. I'm jumping around, moving quick though. I'll, I'll keep going. Um, this piece is called Procession. Um, and I think earlier you mentioned something about, uh, I talked about like, um, there was a thing about my work. I wanted to figure out a way to make work that could heal. Um, so I decided, number one, another thing too, I never knew when the work was finished, so I always I told myself to stop on the seventh layer no matter what. So uh, if the truck, you know, when the truck came, sometimes the paintings were wet. So I started making these paintings that are inside of cabinets, and I deal with cabinets where it's like whenever you get sick, you go to a medicine cabinet and get medicine. And for me, it was like to, um, memory as a form of medicine. And, um, the one on the right is called Uprooted, and it was based around the floods that happened in Houston, Texas. I remember it was a real bad flood, and I had an opening during, that, um, during this flood, and the, um, the flood itself shut down my opening. So they invited me back, and they put me upstairs because I was doing work that was based around water. And so, so that, it's called Uprooted. It's my studio, kind of how I work. Work on several things at one time. 
And these are like some of the works with the photographs. I'm kind of going back and forth in time-wise with, with images. I see I used to paint on doors, and these are doors that were taken from the um, Third Ward and Fourth Ward in Houston, Texas, and based on blues musicians. And the, these, this one in general was based around Jimi Hendrix and putting the guitar on fire, so I kind of put a guitar on fire inside of a door. It's a painting I did for, um, did for the airport in Atlanta, and it was done. And the reason why I showed it sometimes is because I had two months to make the painting and the painting had to be up right before the Olympics and it was kind of like this crazy time period. It's a piece based on my mother, my mother's school teacher. Um, I took like old um, piano tops and created like a, almost like a map in a way. Are you, the white parts are thimbles and dealing with um, constellations but then also dealing with quilt making. Um, and it also has a metrodome on it, so it clicks. Sounds like an old grandfather's clock, and it's based on my mother. This is called Denmark Basie Meet Shango. Uh, this is painted with uh, rum, tobacco, and railroad tracks, crossroads, tracing different things, uh, different practices amongst the Yoruba people. Um, dealing with different deities, like one in particular named Eshu, and dealing with um, crossroads. And some of the materials that are used, like, you know, there's the ta tobacco and those are axes that are used to cut the tobacco, but also did a play between the axe that's on side of the glass, which looks like one particular deity named Shango, and it's really the reflection of the glass on top of the piece, the mirror image. <laughs> And this is another, this is like an installation. Um, you know, when I was in school, I studied sculpture, but the thing about working in sculpture is very complicated because you have to use a lot of materials and steel and storage and making things. So basically, I started painting because it was very complicated to get set up. Um, so, which forced me into a situation of doing installations and working in different ways. So this is like a piece that was from installation. Some of these are like sculptures that deal with, um, dealing with those who escaped from slavery and got caught, which would, I, the um, slave owners would actually put um, almost like these, these um, collars around them so that you know, they could hear them if they were escaping and had bells on them and just try to make it more difficult for one to escape. And so I started really playing with these blacksmiths and working and playing with like, also like there's a well-known um, um, metal a blacksmith named Philip Simmons in Charleston, South Carolina, who was very much influenced by some of the gate work and metal work he did. And these are some of the same. And this one is more like dealing with a shoe too, and using these symbols of top hats and they're kind of reoccurring throughout my work and also the use of like railroad tracks. And these are some too. This is like a big tarp. It's probably about 20 feet by 15 feet and it's all kind of painted with um, Georgia clay and using shipping tarps and boulders. And this is a piece that's done with a boulder and rock on top of a black canvas. It's called Rockin'. And it was just based around, um, I don't know, Bob Marley, Michael Jackson, dancing, playing. And so uh, this is like some of the early installations where I used sound. I used the sounds of oceans and on the walls, kind of painted like this mint green, which was one of my grandfather's favorite color green. And it was reminiscent of my grandfather, but using the photographs from my family. And so on the wall itself, in, in white, which you can't see, it has different bodies of water all around the world in different parts and different places in space. Um, you know, from the Mississippi to Niger, and then there's different places in outer space. And as you hear the sounds of the ocean, you walk around, you start to hear the sounds of trains. And some of the trains were just dealing with the migration between um, 
north to south and my father being a railroad engineer and um, also my family being a part of the Underground Railroad, one of the reasons why my family um, ended up in New Jersey. And so as you keep walking around, you start to smell the smell of tobacco as you hear the sounds and you smell the tobacco which is on the back on the back of the wall but then also you hear insects on a full moon um, and so what the photograph you saw earlier this is part of installation and this is more so like i was invited uh, back in 90, 98 99 to come back to the school which i graduated and do an installation and it was really me breaking away from doing the typical paintings and I started to get back into making sculptural things. And that's a field where, where my grandfather picked tobacco, so I kind of incorporated a lot of stuff like that. I'm going to move on a little bit faster. Um, this is um, also on my father's side. My father's side, um, they were Garveyites, and so um, I was making reference to my father's side being Garveyites, and, but then also making references uh, our, um, some of our family members that fought in the different war, um, wars, and also on the back of that. So it's a combination of all these thoughts at one time. And when I think about Marcus Garvey talking about going back to Africa, I think more so like what we think about it today. It's really about me understanding my background and who I am. And so basically I have my DNA on the, on the um, throughout the painting itself, and as soon as I found out my DNA, I made this painting. Some of them have no names, I'm just responding. Uh, this one's called Minor Keys, and it's based around um, my favorite jazz musician, which is Sun Ra. Sun Ra talked about outer space, talked about he was from Saturn, but the truth of the matter is Sun Ra was from Birmingham, Alabama. But he said he, he said he was from Saturn. I still believe that he's from Saturn. So inside the um, piano itself, it's gutted out in glass, and over top the top part, there's like a blue tint that goes across it. It's hard to read in a photograph, but the blue itself looks almost like the ocean, and I like to compare um, space and ocean, out of, you know, the two, how we sit somewhere at a crossroads between the two. This was a piece I was, um, I was asked to make, and it was based around the Black Panthers. And it was, the show was called The Whole World is Rotten. And I was doing a piece based around, around the Black Panthers, but also like them with the breakfast program that they created um, and feeding people. Um, so it's a mixture of stuff. This is called Bluebird from the Seventh Sphere, based around Charlie Parker. This is like 93. Uh, this is an exercise that I do every once in a while. It's like whenever I go somewhere, sometimes I want to make a piece within like a couple hours. So basically, uh, there's a radio on the left-hand side, and the radio itself is playing Charlie Parker's music. On the right-hand right side, there's an African finch. And the African finch would jump around and chirp. And then up under on the sheet, on down below, there's a... Um, sheet music down below. And so what the bird would do is poop on top of the sheet music and they created these almost paintings that looked like Jackson Pollock paintings. <laughs> and, the, and it was, and the piece is called, excuse me, but the piece is called bird shit. So <laughs> this is a piece that, I don't know, this was loosely, there's an architect who, I mean, a builder who built my house and studio and I promised to give him a piece for building my house. And so this was a piece that I gave him and it was based around architecture in Louisiana. And there's a place called an Africa House that's in a part of Louisiana, which has this high pitched roof. And I, wanted, I made this piece because I, one, I was making it for the builder, but I also was making it for my children. And it was like, the, you know, thinking about what they want. My daughter wanted a dollhouse. I said, no, I got your dollhouse. So that's what this piece is called, Cascade. Uh, my first passion was to play baseball. Before I went to art school, I wanted to play baseball. 
So I created this fictional league, and the league was called the Liberators. And so it's called Liberators, but these are made on military blankets. And the idea of war, baseball, kind of still the same play of like earlier, um, even more recent stuff. Um, and that's a bat, and the bat's about maybe 10 feet tall, and that's called clean, um, clean up. Um, and my favorite, the position that I play when I play baseball, I was a catcher, so that's a baseball jersey with Georgia Clay um, taken from the Little League baseball field where I grew up playing, and it's meant to be more like a hunter's jacket, um, um, like within West Africa, in terms it has um, amulets and different things wrapped with on, on the um, jacket when they go out hunting, and it's also supposed to protect them. So it's spirit catcher. It's another bat. This is after I did my DNA and traced my, um, my family side to uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea, uh, amongst the Baga and Mende. And so I started doing work about that. And so I, you know, with that piece itself, I just made a little collage of like these boys recovering African art with, throughout the water. Um, this is like a DNA strand I made. And these are paintings. I don't really say much about it. My favorite piece is that there's a boat in the background um, that's right here. And the boat's like a speedboat. And in the back of the speedboat, it has a, where the propellers turn, turns into a DNA strand. And this one's called Black Redemption based around Marcus Garvey's boats, but I also had incorporated, um, at the same time I was making this show and did my DNA, my cousin was making this, he was rebuilding this Cadillac. And this Cadillac he was rebuilding, and what I did was, I did video footage of um, me in Senegal, but I was in a fishing boat. And while I was in the fishing boat, what I wanted to do was, videotape myself going to the door no return and coming back and so within the the car itself with its beautiful sound system and and um project i mean um uh tvs that are in the back they're actually playing that and this was um, parked on top of the campus of clark Atlanta university when i had the show at the gallery with those images with my boat oh yeah that's a speedboat and this is a piece I did based on Door No Return. This was all one show, and I was in two, two different venues. Um, one of them, I actually recreated the door itself uh, with, um, and I took the measurements and I recreated it. I created a wall within the gallery, and on top of it was a, it's a projector. And I took a friend of mine who, she did her DNA, and her name's Fatima Robinson. I went with her, and I went with a guy with name Mark Anthony Thompson. Fatima is a choreographer and she did a lot of Michael, she actually did a Michael Jackson video where she taught the dancers how to dance. And her being a dancer, I took her and then I took a musician with me um, named Mark Anthony Thompson and he just kind of, he goes by the name of Chocolate Genius, but he does this kind of crazy music stuff. And we were, we had similar DNA, so we went at the same time. And that's Fatima when she responded to meeting some of the dancers in Senegal. And so there's this piece that's projected on the back, which is uh, projected on a screen. And then when she spins around, she turns into smoke. I always wanted to create a tintype. So this is like a, my version of a tintype. Um, these are photographs that are printed on steel and they rust, but they don't rust where the images are printed. Um, this is a lantern I've been working on for a while. Um, it's in a show right now, but it's, it's different than what it is now. On the inside, there's a neon N on the inside of it, dealing with North. And it was about my father. And this is another one dealing with, um, I had some images of family members who fought in the Civil War. And this was a big lantern. It's probably about five feet. 
Mm, this piece called Ghost. And Ghost um, is a photograph that I, I made this piece with an iPhone. <laughs> and I took a picture of a negative of a photograph, pointed out in the back of my yard, on the back of my window. And I live on Civil War grounds. And so it's kind of play between, you can kind of, if you look at it in some ways, you can kind of see the woods, but you can also see the negative. So it was just a, you know, a play. This is called um, Storm at Sea. Uh, it's a piece made with piano keys, piano keys turning into waves. And I always felt like my, uh, the first form of DNA for me was music. And I felt like responding to rhythms was similar, like trying to understand your DNA. Um, and the idea was, what if there was this storm at sea that was caused by this African deity that was meant to cause thunder and lightning, um, which is Shango. These are little small paintings I do on sheet music. Um, and this is, I like to make beautiful, bright, colored paintings with very difficult subjects. Um, so this is um, Elmina off the coast of Ghana and um, a slave castle, but it was also using um, classical music and painting over top of it, kind of creating my own soundtrack, almost like jazz in a way. Um, and these are some of similar. But this is a drawing, I call it Western Currents. And it was just like a boat of all like different parts of West Africa and African art. And this is the painting for it. This is probably about 12 feet by 10 feet. And it was meant to show different kinds of weather at the same time. So there's a storm, but it's, the sun's coming out. It's rough, and then it's calm in a way. This is a, a music stand I created. Um, I don't know, it was a response to my reaction to spending time in New Orleans. So all the instruments are from New Orleans. And I forgot what the read was. I, I'm trying to remember the title of the piece. It's really, but you can kind of see. But it's about 11 feet tall. Um, this is a, I don't know, this is a mixture of um, work. This one in particular is called um, World Cup. And so what I have, you know, back during the World Cup when it was in South Africa is really more so observation of me hearing different things or watching TV. And I remember they were playing these little horns, on, what were they called, zuzophones or zuzu or something, but they sound just like bees. And so basically what's happening is you got, I have speakers built inside of that nest, bees in that hive. And so you hear the sounds of, bees buzzing. This is uh, a painting from, from west to east, from south, no, from east to west, from south to north. This is called Cerebral Caverns. That, that face, I usually reoccur in the bust, um, and it's from a death mask from the Congo. And so I kind of reuse it a lot in a lot of different ways. There's a piece based around Sun Ra. That's the piano and spins around. And let me see, and this piece is um, called Windward Coast. And this is, you know, I use that same bus, but it was based around those that were lost at sea, but then also like um, some of the things in terms of the ocean and being out in the ocean can feel so massive. And I remember as a kid going fishing with my father and going so far out where we couldn't see land and feeling so small. And, so it's a, it's a calming piece, but it's also a very difficult piece. Um, it's probably over 400 sets of piano keys. And you also like, a, there's a conch shell in the, in the very corner. Um, 
I remember seeing this conch shell when I went off the coast of Georgia and I went to Cumberland Island. Um, there was a plantation on the island. I remember seeing on this plantation and people weren't allowed to go onto it because the property owners, you know, it was private. And I, what I remember seeing was, were these chimneys stacked. And all I could see was like chimneys and those were where, where the Africans lived. But I remember this one chimney, there was this conch shell right in the middle, right above the fireplace. And it just, you know, for me, it felt like that was like a spiritual gesture that just said something. So I started using the conch shell in different ways. So the conch shell itself has the sounds of me installing the piano keys on the installation, ripping open the box, sounds almost like waves ripping. And at the same time, I'm listening to Coltrane. So that's um, it's kind of like a close up with the bus. This is based on Pullman, pulmonary, pul blues, you know, mixture of music and blood. Um, these are some of the same things that were made around the same time. Once I realized, you know, like there's a reference to a Mende form, which is a sculpture on the right that I spin on a lathe. And I took the form, but then also within this room, I made my smallest, my smallest piece, which was a drawing of um, right here on, uh, on sheet music inside of one of the old tintype photographs from my grandmother. And it was just really making a reference to that. But then in the background where that sculpture was sitting, you can kind of see this form right here. That's the actual sculpture. But then this is the actual sculpture in the collection that I'm referencing. So it's like the mirror reflections on the glass. And that's tricky. Uh, and this one's called Levitate. And um, it's really a boat that's kind of floating in front of the piece. And this is one that is working on, off and on working on it. Oh, sideways. I've been sewing these different regiments of um, regiments from the Civil War, African American troops. Sideways. I'm gonna try to move on because I don't I don't like looking at my older work. This is called Echo. Uh, it's based around the Great Mosque in Mali, um, and it's like the Georgia clay and kind of drips into a uh, conch shell. But it's, it's made out of steel and printed on steel. These are the ones. This is called Ness. I don't know why. And these are based on the voice and double consciousness. So it's like a mirror on this side, almost like a mirror. I don't know, some of these objects and things that I collect, like if I, what I was really fascinated with this piece was, was it's a piano top and I gold leafed it. Part of it is the reason why I gold leafed it. It came from a high school and a lot, a lot of kids when they, in school, I remember, <clears throat> It came from a school that I was supposed to go to. And I remember kids would often like, um, when it came to like music class, it became more like recess. It became, a, it became a whole different thing. So every kid almost carved their name on top of the piece. And so they put their own patina in it. So I just gold leafed it. I know some of these are shown. This one's called Lost and Found. Um, that's my old family photo album. Um, you know, some of it's like, and then on the top, I remember, um, what do you call it? The 14 year, 17 year cicada, the locust. I remember get, being caught in one of those storms and seeing all these bugs flying around when I visit my grandparents. So it's really like um, a ref kind of going back to the memories of that. And, and on the hand, it's like an image of Saturn. I know, how are we doing with time? I'm getting close, I'm moving. Some of these I won't speak much about. Oh, 
This is called On Your Way Up. It's uh, just dealing with crocodiles. All right, let me go. Let me go. Sometimes I work in different, I work in glass sometimes. And that's a vase with um, glass or on the inside. And it's kind of foggy at the bottom. Well, this is a piece, I don't have a title, blue, I think it's called Blue Black. Um, and um, it was based around like a Mary Baraka poem. And, and it just drips uh, indigo. Oh, this is all about the North Pole. So this was like a current, a recent show. Um, I did a big tarp and with tracks on top. Um, and on top of that, there's like the north, there's a big neon, there's a neon in on the top of it. It's about maybe 20 feet by 20 feet. It's a piece based around um, the shooting in, the, um, in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, so the bloodish kind of travels with the with the tracks and the palmetto. All right, I'm getting close to being finished. This is based around um, my um, my father-in-law. Uh, who I didn't know, who I was always a fan of, um, which is Gordon Parks. And so I was commissioned by the Gordon Parks Foundation to uh, make a piece on him. And this was like from one of his photographs, him and he was doing them with um, Ellison, they were doing a piece based on the Invisible Man. And so one of these, um, this was a part of one of the images that was made for the, for, um, for a book with them. And so it's kind of like a, you can kind of walk inside of it. And on the outside, there's like, I used this photograph and kind of cut it out. And so the lights, it's, you know, it's kind of like a 3D piece. These are little sculptures I make every once in a while where I use conductor hats with African art. I'm getting close. I don't want to talk about much. This is a piece I made a couple years ago for Prospect in New Orleans. And I created this piece, it's called Vessel. And I have the sounds of trains, uh, a friend of mine playing the cello on a full moon. And you hear the sounds and there's a fire burning, there's a crack and there's a stereo system built on the inside of it. And, um, it was placed on the Mississippi, right between the railroad tracks and, um, and a park in New Orleans. And this is a recent piece. Uh, I was invited to do a piece for the Istanbul Biennale, and I, meet, I made a piece that was based around the Clotilda, which was a slave ship, a slave ship that was found in the Mobile Bay. And I was dealing with the histories of that, but I also wanted to create somewhat of a vessel um, where someone could be transported, but um, references to slavery, but references beyond slavery, but on the background there's a radio, and on, when you hear the radio itself, the radio is playing, you can kind of see it with a pyramid antenna, but the radio is playing Sun Ra, but June Tyson singing, and basically when she's singing, she sings like when you find her boring, just the same old same thing, sign up, for Out of Space Ways Incorporated. And it plays that, but then also plays the sounds from um, Senegalese uh, fishermen working on boats. While they're working on boats and the ocean's crashing, and you hear them talking back and forth. And then I invited a friend of mine named Taurus Mantine, who's a bass player, and he plays in the background of it too. So I kind of composed this kind of piece in a strange way. But yeah. And yes. And this piece, Pensive. Pensive was commissioned um, 
the piece was first commissioned by um, Amherst. And it was a show that was being put on by Du Bois, I mean, about Du Bois, and there was maybe about 15 of us that were being commissioned to do pieces. And, you know, after knowing and, and reading and living in Atlanta and knowing the history of Du Bois from different angles, he was such a serious dude. I only know how to deal with serious stuff sometimes is through humor. And so there's a, re there's a reference to Rodin. And so I'm, I'm kind of playing back and forth with that and having a conversation while, you know, still digging and searching for information about the voice. I have other stuff. It was, it was, I had the intent on doing this piece. And at the time, I was um, being considered to do an installation at the Royal Museum in Central Africa, which is in Belgium. The Royal Museum of Central Africa, of Africa is in Belgium. And there's a pool and there's a fountain that's right in front of the museum. And there was talk about Du Bois and spending time at the museum. And I was really trying to do research and figure out those, that, those connections and know more about the actual um, event that happened there. And so this piece was more so a piece that I was thinking in, one, in my brain that this was going to be out in front of the Royal Museum of Central Africa um, towards the fountain. So, yeah. So, yeah, pensive. Thank you. I guess I'll take some questions. <laughs> It's so hard to talk about my work. The, the what now, statue? Gammon, that bus by Augustus Savage. Uh -huh. We've been talking about the train and uh, the water and uh, jazz. And so I'm like wondering, is the Harlem Renaissance with the boys, is that one of your favorite time periods to explore? Well, yeah, I, I th well, that's one out of many. Mm -hmm. I think the black arts movement. Oh, and yeah, some of the, Right. Yeah, my, the, first, the first two artists I met when I was, uh, when I was a kid was uh, Jacob Lawrence and James Vandersee. And sometimes I think because of the use of the narrative with, um, with Jacob Lawrence and the use of color, and then also the use of photography in such a way, I feel like I've always kind of like combined almost every single one of those artists that I've actually kind of encountered. But I've always been influenced by like a lot of different movements. You know, I like the movements that like, like a movement between James Brown and Fela. I like the movements between Ali Fakatore and the blues, blues musicians. And so I like a lot of different movements. I mean, I've always been influenced by like filmmakers like Usman Siembre from Senegal and um, you know, there's a lot. And then, you know, it's also like, I, I'm, I feel like I'm that kid of hip hop. You know, I grew up, you know, knowing and not, looking at rap music and seeing it in hip hop in, in a certain way and ways in which things are put together and collaged 
um, to recreate. Um, and I think about you know jazz and music and all of it in the same, a certain kind of uh, where music becomes like the the fuel um, for a lot of us visual artists. We we don't necessarily see them as separate. We see them all within the same, in the same way. So, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other Man. Why you got? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's yeah, Georgia Clay, it's a strange thing. Um I remember my first encounters with Georgia Clay was probably playing baseball and then I think later on I remember um hearing stories about Georgia Clay. Some people would talk about they use it and they eat it and they drink it. Some people, you know, you hear the history of talk about those that lost lives and blood in the earth. Then there's a talk about Native Americans um, in terms of the clay itself. Um, and I just always, I've always been fascinated. And then when I look at, look at the earth, um, uh, images that I've seen and of like Molly and seeing similar like colors. So for me, that's some of my, my personal references, but I'm also, I'm still fascinated. I, I think it's still like a, a lot to learn about it, but I don't know. I think sometimes I'm actually using things because I don't know much about it and I want to learn more about it. So I play with it until I get the answer. So you may have come in here and told me something that I didn't know, and that would have been perfect, and I would have carried on to the next lecture. <laughs> Your work is very diverse, and uh, myself work in a similar way. You mean, you, when you say archival, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I would hope it lasts a long time, but it's also, um, I, think it, I think work changes no matter what. I had a friend I went to school with, and he made these paintings that always were moving. No matter what, they just moved. And I thought that that was beautiful, but it's also not necessarily practical. Um, but I've always tested limits. I've always used materials that were not non-traditional. And I actually love working with things that are non-traditional materials because I just get more out of it. But um, I, haven't had, I haven't had any real problems yet. So. You said, what were my intentions? Yeah. I just wanted, I think it was more than anything, it was really like, how, do, how can I hold on to this and share it with people? Um, it's strange because you look at these photographs and you see, these, you see a lot of these people and they're dressed up and they're, you know, in a certain way. And, you know, there's, there's an assumption sometimes, like with, with a lot of my images, that because I live in Atlanta, that they may be from Georgia or 
from the south, but a lot of photographs are from the north. Um, my intentions, I don't know. I think it's just to preserve. I mean, just to kind of honor my grandmother for making that, sharing that with me at that time. But I don't know if I answer your question, but. Yeah, you're, uh, you're a New York gallerist, uh, Jack Shaman, yeah. has a bunch of very interesting artists uh, that he shows mm -hmm. your works. Uh, and I know that there have been some collaborative shows that involve your work, but mm -hmm. how much interaction do you have with some of the, uh, the interesting people that show at his gallery? <laughs> I'm thinking of Walker Corday and Walker yeah, yeah. Yeah, we see each other every once in a while, have conversations, and we talk shop, and we used to, used to be very close with uh, Barkley Hendricks um, before he passed, and, you know, it's nice to be able to have friends, I mean, that are artists. We artists, we love each other, but we can't deal with each other for so long. We can deal, I mean, we love each other, but we have, we have our own space. <laughs> so it's a, um, it's beautiful. I mean, I think it's um, being in a gallery um, like Jack. I've been with Jack since like 90, 98. And um, it's been a good relationship. And, and, you know, in terms of like the artists of color that are in the gallery, it's a mix from all different parts of the world, which is a beautiful thing. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a nice mix. I don't know. I... So you mentioned a couple of times that you did your DNA. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could say a little more about what that meant, what it affirmed, what it unlocked. It seems like it has informed your art practice in some way. It, I mean, it did. I think what it was was just being an, being an African-American artist and growing up in the States, and not necessarily knowing, you know, you have a sense that you're from West Africa DNA, but you don't know exactly where. So, you know, often, you know, there's, there are these shows that come around throughout the country which deal with different, um, you know, different types of work from different, different places of West Africa that relate to um, our DNA before we even knew. And so often I would go and my, I was doing my research and I was, I was searching and I had a problem to solve and I would just go to the museums, galleries, figure it out. But eventually when this tool came around to that you can test your DNA, it, it opened up a lot. And, um, but, it, but it answered some questions, but some things I, pro I pretty much already knew. Um, so in many ways, it was a good thing, um, and I needed, I needed it at that time. But it's also, um, once I figured it out, it, it put me at ease in a different way, uh, where I could share that with not just myself, and not with just people viewing my work, but with my mother, my father, my brother, you know. And so that was the part for me that was Good. And then I took my brother with me to Senegal. And my brother's into finance. So the, he, he got more out of the trip than I did. And I just remember him sitting at a bar, him having this conversation with this cat from Senegal, and they're talking about money back and forth, and they're just ch -ch -ch, And they're arguing, and they're laughing. And then, you know, here, you know, if you want to go and get something, you got to barter. And my brother's the best barter. So. Mm -hmm. So that was just like a beautiful experience. So I remember those kind of experiences. Um, but yeah, I think it's, um, and when I did the trip, um, I did it with a festival called the National Black Arts Festival in Atlanta. And so they, as a part of doing it, um, we did one whole middle school. Middle school in Atlanta's DNA. All the kids had, had their DNA done. So, which I, which was like, so. Uh, 
what was my um, introduction? Um, oh, it's kind of private, but kind of, let's just say this. I was a part of someone who I helped have someone made and I was a participant within it, but at the same time, I was not allowed to be in because they felt like I knew too much and I didn't want to, they didn't want to interrupt my freedom to do what I want to do the way I want to do it. And so, yeah, and it was by, and it was by way of Cuba, by way of San Francisco, Oakland. Um, yeah, and there are, yeah, so that was kind of like my connection. All right, so we're going to uh, cool. bring this together and make it correct.